Well, welcome to uh, this special edition of Talking Trucks. And with me is Mark Erskine, and we're going on a journey in the UK. We're actually in England, as you can probably tell by the, the pub and the uh, little house behind us there made of uh, wattle and daub and That's it. the uh, thatch roof. <laughs> but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to explore the invention of the TS3 Commer engine and the, uh, the, the TS4 and what happened to that. So we're going to be talking to uh, a whole bunch of interesting people. Mark, you're the expert and uh, hopefully you'll do a few of the interviews because you know all the ins and outs of the old TS3 and TS4. So look forward to it. Excellent. Hello and uh, welcome to Amptel uh, Bedfordshire in the UK. Uh, we're here with Don Kitchen who um, is, uh, became the design manager at Roots Diesel Engineering Division who produced the Comma TS3 engines and the TS4 prototypes. And um, uh, to kick it off, I'd, I'd um, like Don to uh, describe how he became involved with Roots in the first place um, from Loughborough College. Uh, I came to be involved most peculiar. Uh, I, w I was offered a job there, and uh, it was the only real job. And uh, I went down for an interview with the chief engineer at, at we used to call him General, General Booth, and after that uh, I had a letter to say, come and start, mm. at about uh, seven pound, seven pound a week, mm. something like that. Mm. And uh, we started in uh, a, a, an office called, in Aldermore. Now Aldermore is a, an offshoot of the main Humber plant. Mm. Uh, we we're on the second floor, there was three other units there. One was the Humber Rolls-Royce military vehicle, the other was the 1725 engine, and uh, then the TS3. Quite isolated from the main uh, Humber drawing office, uh, with staff of three, eventually four, with me on the TS3. Mm -hmm. And in the beginnings, um, uh, it was quite secret what was going on with the development of the TS3, I suppose, in pre-production days? Well, it was secret in the fact that when I went there and asked the question how many horsepower the engine produced, I, I'd never seen the drawings of the engine. Hmm. Uh, everybody looked at everybody and said, uh, you don't ask those questions. No. <laughs> but, um, yes, it was confidential, right. yes. Right. Yes. And when did, we, did you become fully aware of the full design of the engine um, uh, in the early days there? Uh, when somebody said, first job to train you as a draftsman, you can draw the block out. Ah. And the block was five sheets, and it probably took oh, two weeks to draw. Wow. Um, once you'd done that, you had a very good idea right. of what the engine was. Right. And um, having come from Loughborough College with your automotive qualification, um, presumably you would have studied uh, conventional inline engines. Uh, yeah. uh, how did the opposed piston idea appeal to you in the beginning? Made you wonder how it worked. <laughs> Everybody asked the question, why, doesn't, why does it work? Why, don't the, why doesn't it lock up solid? Right. And... Uh, Yes, no, the, uh, at Loughborough, the, the uh, opposed piston was never, never taught. Never yeah. taught. Right. Well, never taught, never really evaluated yes. that. Yeah. Having drawn the whole engine out and understood the concept completely and embraced the idea, uh, in the development of the parts and the design of the components in the engine, uh, which would have been the most difficult parts um, to uh, design and um, uh, make good enough for long, -time use, long term use? Well, the biggest problem was always the rocker lever. Ah, oh, yeah. And uh, when I got to the drawing office, there was a, a skip underneath one of the desks with broken rocker levers. <laughs> yes. And I think that the main thing was that originally they, they thought they could uh, take the force in two separate arms mm -hmm. onto a central pivot. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until they put a, a cross beam between each of the arms mm -hmm. that things started to look up. Oh. And once that had been done and 
uh, it was sent up to Ryden, yeah. which was the the Humber test area. Yeah. Once that was done, and uh, the rocker lever broke the beam of the testing machine, yeah. we accepted it. Wow. And when you get to the manufacturing side, they were able to do the expert polishing right. and the shop painting mm. and the uh, deburring of, of some of those little oil drilling. Mm. Once that had been done, it was a successful rocker. Right. Um, I can't remember failing any rocker levers uh, through normal use. Right. Uh, they failed when there's been a manufacturing, found a manufacturing right, fault, right. something daft that shouldn't mm, have happened. Mm, mm, but otherwise, no, that rocker lever is safe, right. provided it's manufactured to the drawing. Right, right. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the rest of the engine, though, was uh, the crankshaft. Um, it, it's an interesting crankshaft because it doesn't have counterweights. That's and, right, um, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it was a nice light crank yeah, and um, yeah. very rigid. Very yeah. generous overlaps on the bearing fillets. And no no uh, problem on the crank. Right. Conrods. Conrods were... Uh, the only changes on the conrods really were the conrod bolts, mm. which uh, every time there was an increase in power, mm -hmm. the conrod bolt sizes went up. Right. And uh, they, uh, they went from, I think, three-eighths to half-inch. Mm. And the last change necessitated the bolts going in the wrong way around. Because oh. the bolts, at the moment, go from the back to the front of yes. it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it's totally different to oh. the normal way you put a cog rod sure in. Sure, it is, yes. And that's yeah. why. The reason was there isn't enough room oh. if you do it the other way around. Oh, right. Okay, so there was no sort of mechanical advantage in doing it that way. There well, just wasn't enough room. Just could you fit it? Right. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And um, as far as the, the next stages of development are concerned, um, uh, they originally came out at, uh, I think, 70 horsepower in the industrial um, uh, range with Roots Lister, yeah. 90 horsepower in the first trucks. I yeah, think. yeah. And Gradually got... Yeah. And in 1963, I think, 62, 63, you went to 117 horse yeah. with the 3DA engine. Yeah. And um, uh, what were your impressions of that engine at early stages? Um, uh, it, it was a, still with the 199 crankcase, no, no, just with greater thermal loading. Nothing loading. special. Right? Nothing special. Mm -hmm. I mean, the biggest change, biggest change that ever took place on the three-cylinder was, one was the crankcase. Mm -hmm. And two was getting rid of the chain. Right. And the chain was a problem in that it initially stretched mm. and it was manually adjusted. Yes. Then it went to an automatic adjuster, mm. which automatically kept putting tension on the chain. Right. Uh, and then they went to the gears. Right. And the gear was a, a, literally to plonk on the back of the block. Right. On a mounting plate. Yes. Yeah. And the, uh, the chain... If if the mechanics followed the uh, workshop manual instructions and adjusted the chains normally, mm -hmm. uh, there generally wasn't a problem with them. It was just the the fact that that probably never happened as often as it should have. It didn't help. Right. If yeah. if you if you've got something to adjust, it's not going to get adjusted. Right. That's the point. Yeah. Also, um, oh, while we're here, uh, this is the very first um, battery-driven calculator. In Don. fact, probably the only battery-driven calculator Don that was that. yes, yeah. that, that Don bought himself, not Roots bought, in order to do calculations for the uh, design of the TS3. Well, the it, we wanted a calculator in the office. I remember buying it, and that wasn't cheap in right. those days. No, but um, when you look at it now, <laughs> and you can go and buy a scientific one for an eighth of the price. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, wonderful that this uh, this has survived. This is a real piece of history. It's only survived because it's been in the drawer upstairs and I've forgotten about it. <laughs> <laughs> talking to uh, talking to Don, hmm. the, in in the little rockers here, there's some little bit of a hole. Or sure. Uh, yeah. Well, um, the rockers were very cleverly made items. Um, mo the most cleverly made in the engine, and you had to, once they were finished, you then had to drill down through the centre of the rockers from either end 
uh, to put an oil hole in so that the oil supply from the rocker shafts could come up to the rocker pins at either end of the rocker. And um, so that was a hole about that long and a 332 diameter, so very small, very long. So let's see this thing doing its thing. Sure. Um, once again, a post piston diesel engine. You've got two pistons in each cylinder. Um, inlet ports on this side, exhaust ports at this side, no valves, no camshaft, no cylinder heads. Wonderful simple device and um, when you turn it over you've got the pistons going into inner dead centre coming out again, the power charge transferred around the rocker onto the crankshaft underneath. Just by another couple of arms. A couple of conrods, yep. yeah. And um, uh, so uh, this is a, an engine that has three cylinders, it has six pistons and it has 12 conrods, just to confuse the viewers. Um, as the pistons pull back, the exhaust ports are exposed first and that um, allows the unburnt gas or the, the hot gases to exit into the uh, exhaust manifold. Shortly after that happens, the inlet ports open uh, at this end and the scavenge blower, which would normally be mounted here, um, blows a, a charge of fresh air in through the inlet ports into the cylinder and the, the ports are angled so that the air goes in and swirls, most important for combustion, and that pushes the last of the exhaust gases out the exhaust ports. And, yeah, and that process that is... So both, both ports are open at the same yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. And um, then as the cycle continues, the uh, exhaust piston comes back and the exhaust ports are closed slightly before the inlet ports are closed and that allows the fresh air to dam up against the exhaust piston and it's called um, trapping efficiency. So these engines have wonderful, it basically traps air and gives a slight supercharge effect and then the uh, cycle continues, the uh, inlet piston closes the ports, the piston comes up to in a dead centre, you get a squirt of diesel in between the pistons, bang, and the cycle starts again. <clears throat> nice oh. and easy, nice and simple. Uh, compared to a four-stroke with valves and cylinder heads and push rods and timing gears and everything else, um, this is outrageously simple and so reliable. Now, Don Kitchen was the designer, well, one of the designers, yes, and yes. all this has basically come out of somebody's head. Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it remains to be seen uh, where the idea came from. Um, but this engine is certainly unique. It's so far ahead of anything else that's remotely like it that um, it, it came down to Eric Coy, who was the chief engineer, Heinz Stransky, who was the design manager initially, and Don Kitchen, who was the, um, he came in as a draftsman at the early stages in 52, but then quickly moved up through the ranks because he's a talented engineer. Um, so in the end, there was a team of 13 but in the initial stages of putting the prototypes together, there was really only three or four people. Wow. And, and, which is really amazing sure. because you can't do something that's completely unique quickly. You've got to no, so talk I'm... about the idea, you know, for hours and hours, and then doodle on bits of paper for months, and then refine your designs. And when you've got the designs, then you've got to do stress calculations to make sure your design's not going to fly to bits. Uh, because these are very high performance diesel engines and um, the calculations had to be done by hand uh, in the early stages because there were no, not even no computers, no calculators. So um, you had to do it by logs, you know, with a sharp pencil. Sure. Right. Yeah. So the process to get to this stage was um, uh, arduous, but I think in those days the engineers were better than the ones we have today. But today we're reliant on computers and 3D modelling and software. In this era, um, they really had to get it right straight out. I think I spent hours doodling right. on scrap paper to see what you could possibly do because right. nobody had done that kind of thing before. Right. So then they'd send us away and get a block. Yep. And make it, and then all the parts. Make and, sure. And everything is machined exactly to the drawings that Don and the other guys had. Um, done it had to be precisely plus or minus nothing to, to those drawings and uh, if it was done to drawings the engine was a success and uh, it went to market initially in 90 horsepower version uh, in 1954 
And, and if you have a look at this photograph, uh, um, people, there's a photograph of the actual truck that was in the, the London um, display, I suppose, uh, launching the truck and uh, chrome everywhere. And uh, it's amazing that that truck still exists. Hmm. Yeah, and um, so the development phase continued, and in fact it never stopped, but uh, they had got the engine over 10 years, which is a, really a quite a long development phase by today's standards, um, but a, probably quite a short time considering that they didn't have computers or even battery calculators when they started. No. Um, so because <clears throat> when they came to market they were revolutionary and, and they were well accepted despite the unusual uh, engine design and Roots did very well out of these. The TS3 powered commas went everywhere in the world and they put companies on the map everywhere. Well, we, we bought a second hand one uh, tractor unit off Europa. Um, I think it was a 90 horsepower one TS3 diesel and we put a tandem axle semi tipulator on it and at that stage we had a what we called a, a, a number on the wharf carting phosphate from the wharf we used to put about a 20 to 21 ton payload on it and <laughs> grind our way to either Oni Hunger or uh, Odahu to the phosphate works. So many gears did you have in this thing? I uh, had a f five speed gearbox and a two speed back end. So just 10 to do all that? 10, yeah that's right. And Mark as you were saying the Roots never designed these things to do 21 tonne. Not at all and, and uh, bearing in mind Ian's talking about payload so it's 21 tonnes plus the weight of the truck, plus the weight of the trailer. On a you had a trailer on as well? Oh, a right, semi-trailer. Yeah. 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 On a truck that was rated, the, the gross weight of the vehicle, that's the load and the truck, of seven tonnes. But that's all we could get. Yeah, and they served with distinction they, uh, in New Zealand and Australia. They seemed to tolerate um, uh, this sort of overuse. Um, primarily because of the really good build quality. They were very strong engines and the chassis and brakes uh, were very good quality for their era. Sure. And it's a, a memorable experience, Buff. Uh, we didn't really make any money until we bought Commas. Oh, okay. and, uh, so that's a memorable experience? It <laughs> was very memorable, yes. <laughs> and and that's, the, that's exactly the case with other transport operators. Um, nobody ever made as much money on other types of trucks because these things wouldn't break. And this model here is only 3.2 litre, and, and in New Zealand, on logs, um, it was not unusual to get up to a 30 tonne payload uh, <laughs> with logs, uh, and a truck that was rated for 7 tonne. And that was just, that's the weight of the chassis and the truck, plus the driver and his lunch, and the payload, total 7 tonnes. These things were doing 30 tonnes in the forest. Astonishing. Absolutely. Yeah.